cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wesley. This is Wu Can Cook. Uh, today we're doing a recipe from my YouTube channel that came out uh, last Friday. Uh, <coughs> that's uh, essentially a more or less a pretty straightforward mapo tofu, uh, which is like a Szechuan or a Chinese, uh, like a Chinese spicy Szechuan stir fry uh, that makes use of the. Uh, makes particular use of the Szechuan peppercorn. Uh, but we're gonna do a couple of things, or one thing that's quite unique to it, uh, which is actually the, the original recipe that we did, uh, does one thing that's quite unique to it, and it includes a little bit of stinky tofu, which is interesting uh, in its own right. Because of the way that it's fermented, I actually, uh, stinky tofu actually has to be done uh, over the course of a couple of days, and I forgot to do it. So uh, we're gonna omit that part today uh, and just make a, um, a little bit of an interesting mapu tofu today. Uh, without that stinky tofu, then it's gonna do just fine. So, uh, if you have any questions for me, feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Hopefully, I can be helpful or informative, or at the very least, entertaining to watch. Uh, as always, if you're looking for the recipes, uh, they always live over on my YouTube channel. So uh, those recipes, they're out every Friday. So last Friday, we came out with this recipe, which is going to be a lot more accurate than the way that we're going to do it tonight uh, because I am missing one very, very critical ingredient, which is the stinky tofu. So, uh, so uh, but if you're interested in reproducing this stuff yourself, I highly recommend hopping over to the YouTube channel and checking out what's going on over there because lots of fun stuff coming up. Uh, we're also working our way up to 55, 60 thousand subscribers by the end of the month uh, so if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal please hop over and give it a subscribe lots of fun stuff coming up cool all right so kicking things off i'm starting off in a little bit of a weird order today i don't know why i did this uh, but we're kicking things off with our green onions which you'll notice i started off by separating so this is just the whites of our green onions uh, for the particular reason, uh, the reason that we're separating these is because the whites of your green onions, they tend to be a little bit uh, rigid and more onion-like. Think of it like that. Uh, which means that the, those whites are going to be um, more abrasive if you try and eat them raw. Uh, so what I like to do is to take these whites and we're going to toss them into our wok fry and give them a cook. Uh, and that's going to cook off a little bit of that harsh like brightness that you get with the whites of your green onions. Uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to take these greens. Where's our greens? Uh, we're going to take these greens of our green onions. Uh, and then we're going to chop these for our garnish. So uh, one thing that you might have noticed if you were watching at the very beginning. Uh, these green onions, we're using all of them. They're pretty old. Uh, we're using uh, green onions. I think these are like two weeks old now. Uh, which uh, they stay pretty well. Uh, if you keep them in water, they can you can keep your onions for a whole two weeks and it'll look okay. Uh, but right around the two week mark, you will no notice uh, that they start to wilt quite a bit, and then you get like little brown tips on the ends. Uh, sometimes you'll even notice some of the greens will start uh, completely wilting, and then you basically have to throw that stuff away. Uh, when that starts happening, what I usually do is I'll just pick around the parts that are brown. Uh, uh, and it's going to taste just fine. As long as you don't eat the wilted part, you don't want to eat that. So it's going to be really uh, gross. Uh, but just pick off the wilted part and you'll still be okay. All right, so there's the greens of our green onions. We're going to set this aside. Uh, we're going to use this as a finishing garnish later on. So this is going to be the very, very, very last thing that we add. Uh, and we'll also, for uh, those keeping track, is going to be the only thing that doesn't actually get cooked into cross-contamination. This is by far the most important thing to make sure it uh, stays nice and far away from your raw meats because that's the only thing that's not going to benefit from a long, hot cook time. All right, next up, so this is our garlic uh, up next. When I'm doing this, I'm giving that a really good crush. Uh, a little while ago, we did, uh, oh, I think that was last week, we did a crispy garlic noodle. Uh, and that garlic noodle, what I did is I used some very thinly sliced garlic. Uh, and in order to achieve that very thinly sliced garlic, what we did was we used a whole whole cloves of garlic, so we didn't crush the garlic. So uh, when we did that, you might have noticed, but it took a lot longer. It took like almost three times as long to peel the garlic because uh, when you don't crush the garlic, it takes a lot longer to get this garlic uh, peel off. So you'll notice that you have to like kind of peel around everything if you don't peel it. Uh, so uh, to benefit, one of the big benefits of crushing your garlic uh, is that you don't have to do this part <laughs> because it's really annoying uh, and it takes a super long time. So what I like to do uh, is we're going to give the garlic a good crush and, and all that skin is going to pop right off for us. 
like so. Uh, it's also going to open up all of the allicin, so that crush uh, is going to release. Uh, you could think of it as like the juice of your garlic. It's going to be real nice, uh, and it's going to make uh, impart a lot more aromatic flavor from that garlic uh, than it would otherwise be able to do without that crush. So, uh, always crush your garlic. Uh, then what we're doing is I'm just doing a quick, uh, almost like a rough chop. You don't need to be super cautious about the way that you chop your garlic, uh, especially once that it's crushed, uh, because once you give it a good crush, it's basically going to start falling apart already. Um, so the only times that I'm ever really, really careful about the way that I crush my garlic uh, is if I'm using it raw. So if it's not going to benefit uh, from a long cook time or even a short walk cook, um, that tends to be a little bit more beneficial to make sure that we go through and do a nice fine mince. Uh, but otherwise, a uh, good little rough chop is going to do, our good do the trick for our garlic today. Alright, so that's the garlic. Uh, then last up for our aromatics, this is about an inch or about a tablespoon of ginger which we're going to peel. Uh, this is just using the soft side of a spoon, this is just a regular old tablespoon. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're pulling off all of this exterior skin. Um, so if you're ginger, by the way, if it's super fresh, uh, like if you just got it at the grocery store, actually, it might even need to be even fresher than that. Uh, if you're like, if your ginger looks like it's still damp on the outside, like it literally just came out of the soil, uh, which if you get to the Chinatown markets early enough, you'll be able to find that. Uh, you really don't need to peel the ginger uh, because that skin is not going to be not tough or chewy. Uh, once it starts getting to the state that this ginger is in, this ginger is, I think, a day and a half old, uh, you're going to start needing to needing to peel that ginger because it is going to start getting really chewy on that exterior skin. But it's really just that first layer, though, which is why I say you can use uh, the soft side of a spoon to pull that off. So for our ginger, we are going to go and uh, do that fine mince. So that's three slices down the center, one down the middle. Uh, and there's our, you could think of that as like a medium dice, I guess. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is run our knife through the ginger uh, and that's gonna give us our fine mince. You're learning so much, oh cool, yeah. I'm glad that I can be helpful and informative. So that ought to do it for our ginger. So we're going to set all three of these aside. Uh, in a lot of the recipes that you see on the Wukang Cook channel, uh, you'll see these three items categor categorized as the aromatics of our wok fry. So that's going to be our garlic, the ginger, and the whites of our green onions. So these three often are going to come together uh, and we'll oftentimes time it out in the same spot when it goes into the wok cook. So these will usually be, uh, unless we're doing something weird, uh, which is pretty infrequent, uh, these are going to be the first three things that go into our wok. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bloom out their aromatic qualities. That usually takes about 10-15 seconds. Uh, and then once it's nice and fragrant, we're going to move on to the rest of our stir fry. But uh, before we dive into that, those are going to be the first three things that go into the wok. Uh, today, uh, we're going to do something. We're actually going to do one thing before we do that. We're actually going to dry toast our spices first. Uh, but as far as the wok fry itself goes, where we're actually frying the actual stir fry, uh, those are always going to be the first three, three things that go in. So moving on next up, this is our tofu. So like I mentioned earlier, uh, <coughs> in our original recipe, we did uh, stinky tofu, which uh, st stinky tofu, by the way, if you're not familiar with it, uh, comes from all over the place. I honestly think uh, the where I know it from is from Taiwanese uh, street food culture, um, but I'm pretty sure that it also has origins in Chinese street food culture uh, and many, many other places too. Uh, but most often what you will generally see when you see things referred to as stinky tofu, it's referring to a dish called chou tofu, which literally translates to stinky tofu, uh, is uh, a fried, uh, sometimes done with like silken, but most often done with firm tofu. 
uh, and it's going to be shallow fried and then uh, dipped uh, and fermented. Before it's shallow fried, it's fermented in a uh, white fermented bean curd, uh, which gives it this very, very pungent and like smelly flavor or quality to it. Uh, also gives it a really, really tasty flavor to it. Uh, in the particular version that we're doing today, so what what you would, uh, we would often find, or what you where you we you would find if you were looking up the recipe, uh, we had done. Uh, stinky tofu, which we didn't fry. We actually just left that tofu raw. Uh, and then what we did is we tossed it into a mapu tofu, uh, which is uh, basically what we're doing today right now. Uh, I forgot to do the stinky tofu, so that stuff has to be uh, fermented for two days. Uh, and I just forgot to do it. <laughs> so what we're doing today uh, is our pretty straightforward stinky tofu, mapu tofu, uh, but with a couple of fun additions to it. What we're going to do is uh, stir fry or uh, fry up our own chili oil, which is kind of uh, but in lieu of that stinky tofu, this is just some soft tofu and this has got to go right into our stir fry. Uh, the more commonly how you would find mapu tofu done is with that soft tofu. Uh, this dish, by the way, uh, the recipe that we're doing if you're here in Oakland or in the East Bay at all, uh, the dish that we're doing, the stinky mapu tofu uh, recipe, is inspired by one that you can find in Oakland uh, at a restaurant called Spices 3, which is like a really, really popular Szechuan place here in, uh, in the city. You constantly forget to prep things. Yeah, uh, that was my bet. I should have done it. It was. Uh, it's what it really gets me is when I have to prep stuff that's days in advance, like stinky tofu, because I honestly was not thinking about what I was supposed to be cooking today uh, until today. <laughs> uh, and then at that point, once I did, when I did remember that I was supposed to have done that, uh, it was much too late. Like I literally remembered at like 12 o'clock today, and it's like forgot to do that. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad that other people forget that too. All right, so next up, uh, this part, by the way, is optional. You can leave out the meat if you want. Lots of people ask me for like vegetarian ways of cooking mapu tofu. Uh, and honestly, the best way to cook a vegetarian mapu tofu is just leave the meat out. Uh, there's, there's plenty of protein going on with that tofu already. Uh, but you can leave this out entirely if you don't want to, or if you're trying to create something that's vegetarian or even vegan. Yeah, I think it's vegan. I think without this meat, it is vegan. Um, so yeah, if that if that's your game, you can totally leave this part out entirely. Uh, what we're using right now, this is ground turkey, I believe. Uh, probably what you'll more, more commonly find is some ground pork. Uh, I'm using ground turkey because it was the one, the ground pork is uh, frozen in three pounds. It would take a long time for me to defrost. So we're using ground turkey today, uh, pretty much exclusively for that reason. Uh, next up, that's half a teaspoon of white pepper, uh, and then this is going to be half a teaspoon of cornstarch. Uh, you might, if you've watched these streams before, uh, notice that that's kind of like my default marinade for most ground mixes uh, when I don't know what else to do. Uh, and then the last thing that we're going to add, this is going to be just a single tablespoon of Shaoxing wine. Uh, and that's going to give us like a little bit of tenderness to our mints too. Uh, and also a little bit of brightness. Yeah. Wu can cook. Yeah, thank you. You're broke as fuck. And you might have to, yeah. Oh yeah, definitely get groceries. Uh, if you're like, everybody's got to eat and groceries are going to be cheaper than eating out. So that's going to be, in the long run, better for you. Wow, somebody tipped. Wow, thank you for the tips. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad I'm glad that I'm able to write recipes that people are cooking. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the tips. That's cool. <laughs> That's cool. All right, so there's our ground mints. Uh, if you're really committed, this should marinate for at least an hour. Uh, this will probably only marinate for maybe 30 minutes or so, kind of depending on how long it takes to do our uh, chili crisp oil. But uh, uh, if you're really committed, marinades at least an hour. Uh, usually I end up doing it for about 15 to 20 minutes because I'm lazy. Yeah. All right, so next up what we're going to do, so by the way, if at this point, if you want to skip this step, uh, 
We're gonna, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna make a chili oil from scratch, which I figured out a way to do that uh, in a relatively quick time. I think it's gonna take us maybe 20 minutes over low and slow heat. Uh, if you wanna skip that step, you can absolutely skip that step. Uh, chili crisp oil is really easy to find in stores. Uh, this is the one that I usually use. It's called Lao Genma, or it's made by a brand called Lao Genma, and it's literally labeled spicy chili crisp oil. Uh, it's a really good, uh, nice, fun, and easy shortcut to do. Uh, if you don't want to do that, though, you can absolutely uh, dive into the to the pre-made stuff. Um, look at this. Um, but uh, if you do want to take take a shot at making your own chili oil, uh, it is really simple. It's basically just low and slow heat on chili oil or oil. Uh, we're going to use some peanut oil, I believe, is what we're using today. Uh, and then we're going to turn that fire really low. We're going to go for about... Uh, 20, 15, 20 minutes over really, really low and slow heat. Uh, and we're gonna just let it cook. And what that's going to do is it's going to extract all of the capsaicin from our chilies. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use, this is gonna be two? Yeah, two different kinds of chilies today. So this is gonna be some Thai chilies. Uh, and then we're going to throw in some uh, tangent peppers too. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> cool. Uh, so uh, here, uh, here are Thai chilies. These are a little bit old, um, as you'll notice, which is actually part of the reason why I want to use these up right now. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to ch uh, chop up a crazy amount of Thai chilies. So this is like enough Thai chilies to do like a whole like two or three dishes. Uh, usually in most stir fries, we would do like one, like three or four Thai chilies in an entire dish. This is what, like maybe 10 Thai chilies. Uh, the reason that we're using so many is because we're going to uh, low and slow cook this stuff for a while, which is going to be uh, releasing all of that capsaicin. So it's going to kind of like remove all of that heat for us. Uh, this, by the way, if you want, uh, you can also just use a red chili flake that would work too. Uh, but what we're doing here, I'm, oh, it doesn't look too great. <laughs> I'm de-stemming our Thai chilies. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is slice these super thinly and then toss them in the wok over real slow heat. Yeah. All right, so those are our stems. Uh, this I'll also at this point also worth mentioning uh, that when you're chopping Thai chilies especially, uh, but just any chilies in, in general, uh, it's very useful to have a super sharp knife. Uh, if your knife is not sharp, especially with chilies, but like bell peppers, uh, jalapenos, all of that stuff, because it has that waxy exterior surface, uh, what it will do if you don't have a sharp knife is that the knife is just going to sort of like slide across the surface of the chili. Uh, which is really, really annoying uh, and also really, really dangerous because it means once your knife starts sliding like that, uh, that's where you get into situations where you might chop a finger or like clip your nail or, or just generally, you might even chop your finger off. So uh, you want to make sure in, that your knife is not sliding as much as possible. So as much as we move our knife around up and down, always going downward, we're never going slide, uh, sliding around like that. Uh, once your knife starts going around like this, uh, that's when you know you are in trouble. Uh, so also, by the way, if you don't have Thai chilies or if you can't find Thai chilies, I know uh, some people can't locate this stuff. You can also substitute it with really any kind of heat that you want. Uh, you could do it with serranos or bird's eyes. Or it's technically our bird's eyes. Uh, you could do it with serranos though. You could do it with fresnos. That would also work just fine. If you've got jalapenos, that would work just fine too. So there's our chilies. So uh, before we assemble our sauce, what we're going to do uh, is get our chili oil going uh, because it's going to take a little while. Uh, so over on the stove, I've got my wok. This is at 
medium low heat, which you will often very infrequently see me doing a medium low heat on a walk uh, is pretty unusual. Uh, the reason that we're going so low and slow today is because we want to make sure that we don't burn these chilies. Uh, so uh, I'm starting off, I think this is going to be about a cup's worth of what should be peanut oil. What we're using right now is grapeseed oil, which is not my favorite thing to use. But uh, Anytime that you're going to taste the oil, uh, you want to use something that has some sort of taste to it. Grapeseed is a neutral oil, uh, which makes it great for cooking because um, you're not imparting a lot of flavor to anything. Uh, but it also doesn't really taste like anything. So in this case, uh, one of my favorites to use would be uh, peanut oil, which is nice and fragrant and aromatic. You could also use uh, olive oil actually might work well too, but I'm actually running out of olive oil too, so that kind of sucks. Uh, what if they're dried, we hydrate? Oh, if they're dry, yeah. So uh, that's a great question actually. Um, so yeah, if you are using dry chilies, uh, which is what we're also going to do. So we're going to pair this uh, with some tangent peppers, which are dry peppers. Uh, they look like this. Uh, you don't want to rehydrate these because once they rehydrate, they lose a lot of flavor. So same same as uh, if you were using like shesh, uh, um, uh, shiitake mushrooms. Uh, the shiitake mushrooms, when they're dried, they're retaining more flavor to it. So like these tangents, for example. Uh, we want to use the flavor that comes from, or use the capsaicin. They're dried like this, so we don't want to rehydrate this stuff. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take these dry peppers uh, and then just toss them in. There it goes. Uh, and so the reason that I'm jumping ahead a little bit is because this is going to take a little while because this is going to go over low and slow heat. Uh, so this is probably going to go for maybe 20 minutes. Uh, and that's going to really start releasing a lot of capsaicin from those chilies. Uh, which means, by the way, it, and this is actually true anytime that you're working with chilies, uh, but especially because if you're doing chili oil like we are right now, uh, make sure all those windows are open because that capsaicin, it's going to start coming out into the air. Uh, and if you don't have open windows, that's going to come back into your lungs and you're going to have a real bad coughing fit if you do that. So, Yeah. Someone who lives in bumfuck nowhere, you appreciate the substitution ideas. Yeah, lots of people um, have trouble finding a lot of the ingredients that we use. Uh, I think in this case, the one of the, the well, this one has a couple of things that are a little bit tricky to find. Uh, if you live near a Chinatown district, they, they should generally be easier, easier to find. Uh, one of the more tough ones to find are these Szechuan peppercorns, uh, which are probably you're only going to find in like Chinese uh, Chinatown districts. Um, sometimes I find them at like Cost Plus or something that might work too. All right, so over on the stuff, I'm going to just keep checking back on this uh, regularly. Uh, this is starting to sizzle a little bit. Uh, just pretty, pretty frequently, we're just going to circle back here and then give that a little bit of a stir. Uh, and that's going to take probably about 20 minutes. But in the meantime, while that's going, uh, we're going to assemble our sauce base here. So we're going to actually, there's two more things that we're going to assemble. Uh, the first is our sauce and the second is our cornstarch slurry. Uh, so we've done mapu dofu on this uh, this channel a number of times. This is actually one of the very very first dishes that we did, uh, one of the very first recipe videos that we assembled. Uh, that one was a little bit more Americanized. This is going to be a little bit more closer to like uh, a more traditional and like, straight ahead mapu dofu. Uh, this is that was four tablespoons of soy sauce, uh, and then just, oh, let's say yeah. Uh, this is going to be two tablespoons of brown sugar, which I forget where I put it. Sorry, one tablespoon of brown sugar. Uh, and that's just for a little bit of extra sweetness, uh, which our dish is sort of lacking in right now. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last bit that we're adding here, this is going to be two tablespoons of doubanjang. Uh, which is a Chinese like fermented chili paste. It's where you get like lots of really, really intense heat. Uh, this particular ver uh, bit, we want to go a little bit easy on this doubanjang uh, because if you're not careful, it can get uh, in the way of our chili, chili oil, which is a little bit more of a um, 
a little bit less aggressive in heat. Uh, so if we go overboard on that dough bun it's just gonna um, bulldozer over all of that wonderful chili oil that we just pulled. Once again, I'm just circling back there and just taking a quick toss, make sure that stuff doesn't burn. All right, so that's our sauce element. We're gonna set this aside that's going into our stir fry a little bit later on. All right, then last up, the last thing that we're gonna assemble here, this will also be the last thing that goes into our stir fry as well. Uh, this is gonna be what you will often see referred to as a cornstarch slurry, uh, which is essentially, this is two tablespoons of cornstarch, two if we measure it correctly, uh, and a bit of water. So I generally don't uh, specify in most recipes how much water to add uh, because it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, depending on how long you let the stir fry go, uh, it's going to just start evaporating that water anyway. Uh, what's most important about your cornstarch slurries is that it is dissolved in water. Uh, so what I think that's probably about like three or four tablespoons of water uh, and two tablespoons of cornstarch. And then we have this nice liquid uh, form of starch. Uh, and that's going to get, uh, get us this really, really thick and like luxurious sauce space when we start tightening things up with our mapo dofu. Uh, without it, you will notice up until the point that we add that cornstarch slurry, uh, things are going to be pretty liquid and loose. All right. Cool. So that's our chili oil. That's the last thing I'm forgetting. Oh, yeah. Alice, oh, yeah. Are the new songs remix is getting put on Spotify? Oh, wow. That's cool. You're going to be at the wedding. Um, they are published. Uh, Atlas, send me a private message about that. They are. They exist in various places. They will not be on Spotify because publishers don't let me put them on Spotify. Uh, Spotify has really, really stringent uh, copyright law, uh, which means that if it, it includes anything that's like already copywritten, like if, if, any remix, basically any remix that has a vocal stem in it, uh, they won't. They won't let me publish it. Um, they exist in various forms on the YouTube channels, so they're. Uh, they're all on the Wu Kang, uh, Wu Cooks Beats YouTube channel, um, but they're always like they're always pretty tricky to get uh, published onto spot uh, onto Spotify and also onto like uh, Apple Music and all those places. Uh, here's the music channel uh, if you haven't found it yet. Uh, some of them are over on that on that the music YouTube channel, uh, but not all of them are um, because the the publishers are they just don't they just don't like those remixes, uh, which is super frustrating. So. Uh, lots of people ask me that though, uh, like why there isn't more content on Spotify. It's because I can't get them through the publishers. Um, they always get flagged, which I get it. It's fair. Uh, all right. Uh, so last up, the last thing that we're going to do is our Szechuan peppercorn. Oops. I guess that's a good reminder to circle back and take a look at our chili oil. Uh, this is looking nice, by the way. Um, can you see it? Yeah, you can kind of see it. Not really as well as I'd like. Uh, kind of like the contrast of our cameras are taking the the tint out of out of our oil. But if you were here, uh, you would notice that our oil is starting to gather a real nice red tint to it, uh, and that's coming from the capsaicin and all of that nice chili oil uh, oil uh, chili releasing into our oil. Uh, it's not super clear on our cameras right now because uh, the contrast on our camera is too low. Well. You can kind of see it though. All right. Uh, meanwhile, the last thing that I'm going to assemble here, this is going to be a little bit of Szechuan peppercorn. Uh, this is also, by the way, kind of optional. Well, yeah, more or less optional. Um, if you want, you can totally just uh, grind up Szechuan peppercorn. It uh, uh, will work just fine. Um, as just a simple ground spice, uh, but and I actually do this with any any um, any whole kernel spice. So I do it with coriander all the time, uh, nutmeg, cinnamon, all those things. Uh, what I like to do is we're going to dry toast this stuff a little bit uh, before it heads into uh, the pepper mill. Uh, actually, this is a mortar and pestle. But uh, if you want if you want to make this simpler, uh, you can skip this step uh, and just grind it up. 
Uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just hold this stuff uh, in a pepper mill itself and then you can just grind it straight through a pepper mill. Uh, you generally, uh, if you don't remember to dry toast it or if you don't take the time to dry toast it, uh, you'll probably have to use a little bit more of this stuff uh, because, uh, yeah, you'll probably have to use a little bit more of it. It might be the first time in a really long time that we're going to use a pan that is not a wok in this channel. Uh, over over on our side burner, I'm moving our chili o chili oil over to the side burner. Because that's probably going to take a while. Uh, so, uh, if you're there's no camera on the side burner, by the way, uh, but it's also not really doing anything. Uh, and over on our main burner, I've got a nice. Uh, stainless steel saucepan, and then what we're going to do is toss that uh, Szechuan peppercorn in the pan. Let it go also over low and slow heat, uh, and that's really going to bloom out a lot of capsaicin from the dry toast. Uh, so once again, uh, not just Szechuan peppercorns, but really any whole kernel spice. Um, we do it a lot because uh, the coriander goes in our uh, pickled shallots that we do at our food pop-up. Uh, that stuff has to be dry toasted, otherwise it doesn't really taste like anything and you would end up having to use a lot more uh, a lot more of it before you really taste it. Yeah. Sister Silent, oh yeah, totally. Uh, so the marble bowl is actually not a, a, a well, I guess it's technically a bowl. Uh, yeah, I guess it's technically a bowl, but this is actually the mortar and pestle. The reason that I'm using it uh, is because it's gonna go back into this bowl. Uh, and the reason that it has to be made out of marble is so that we can grind stuff in it later on. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> technically a bowl. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to finish dry toasting that Szechuan peppercorn. Uh, then we're going to bring it back over here and then give it a nice crush. Uh, and then once it's crushed into this nice powder, um, aromatic and like bloomed out quality to that pepper. Cool. This chili oil is nearly there, I think. You found the garlic roller. Oh, dang. Uh, Sam, where, tell me where you found it. <laughs> I, I have been looking for that thing uh, for a while. I think that I found it at Bed Bath & Beyond once. I think. And then I didn't buy it for dumb reasons. I think I didn't buy it because I was like, I don't need garlic crusher. I'm just going to chop everything. Um, but yeah, I, honestly, I have not seen it, seen it since. Uh, I literally have no idea. I don't even know what to search for <laughs> for that garlic crusher. Alright, so our Szechuan peppercorns, those are coming along nicely. This is weird not using a wok on the stream right now. Uh, we're over pretty low and slow. This is at like medium low heat. Uh, very, very important when you're dry toasting stuff, that's got to be over uh, no higher than medium heat. Even the medium heat might burn that spice. Uh, and then what we want to do is give it constant agitation. Uh, dry, dry toasted peppers will absolutely burn on you real quick. So. So don't walk away, don't start doing something else, because uh, that stuff is going to burn on you. They sell it at Target. No way. I've been up and down the Target aisles. I have le legit looked for that thing hard at Target. With what Target? <laughs> I'm going to look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for it again, but I have looked so much for that thing at Target. All right, so there's our Szechuan peppercorn. Uh, you can kind of see it on this camera. This is a better camera. Uh, it is 
darkened but not burnt. So we want uh, pretty dark and toasted but not burnt. Once it starts burning, uh, then you're gonna taste burnt spices, which is not what we're after. All right, so we're grinding that up and that's nice and powdery at this point. Uh, if you were here, you would be able to smell it. It's quite fragrant. Uh, I love the smell of Szechuan peppercorn. It's very nostalgic for me. All right, then back over on the stove, we're moving our back over here and you can take a look at our chili oil going. Uh, this is nice and darkened up. Uh, you can kind of take a look at the oil itself, which is that's this nice uh, bloomed color. Uh, this, by the way, at this point, if you want, you can pass this stuff through a sieve. I think in the original recipe, uh, I passed it through a sieve. Uh, and what that does is essentially just removes all of that chili crisp uh, from your chili crisp oil. Uh, and then if you want, that would essentially, you can just drop that oil straight into your stir fry. Uh, that will absolutely work. You saw it online? I don't believe you. <laughs> I have looked so hard for that garlic press. Uh, I don't believe you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for it again. Garlic press is at Target. I'm going to look. I literally go to like I literally go to Target like once a month, and I, I have looked for it every time I'm at Target. <laughs> All right. So uh, off off heat. Now here's our chili crisp oil, which is once again chili and oil. That's basically all chili crisp oil is. Don't make that more complicated than it needs to be. <laughs> you all die of coughing, yeah. Uh, it is it is quite abrasive to the lungs. Yeah, you definitely want like a real good overhead fan uh, because that stuff uh, is quite, yeah, quite aromatic. But I love the smell of Szechuan peppercorn. It's very nostalgic for me. Yeah. Cool. Cooking with Lao, yeah, I have checked out Lao, uh, Cooking with Lao. Um, I used one. I used one of the techniques that I picked up. From. I think it was an eggplant. I think that was Cooking with Lao. Um, lots of good tips from Cooking with Lao. That guy knows what he's doing. I think it was a guy. Yeah, uh, but yeah, thank you though. Definitely, definitely need to check out what's going on over there. <laughs> Don't walk away or else it will burn. Yeah, I absolutely, I just feel that. Anytime that I'm cooking, I immediately get distracted. That's actually the things that I mess up the most. That's also the reason why I mess up really simple recipes so often, uh, is because I'll like get distracted and I'll like do other things, uh, which that's, that's the number one way that I make mistakes. So uh, not sometimes I'm not even doing other things. I'll just like tune out. Uh, and like just stop paying attention and like go on pilot. That's generally when I start making mistakes. Oh. Okay, and this is quite hot. All right, so over on the stove, our wok is getting ripping hot. This is about as hot as a wok is gonna get at home. Uh, and then at this point, you'll notice, so we've been streaming for, this is coming up on almost an hour now, we're at 40 minutes. Uh, the rest of this stir fry is going to happen in like five minutes, maybe. So here we go. Here's our, this is now grapeseed oil going into the wok. Uh, then we're going to do our long yao, which is going to basically just coat the wok, a hot wok in cold oil. That's going to give us this nice non-stick surface. Uh, then up first, that's our garlic going in, uh, followed by our ginger. Uh, and finally, the whites of our green onions. Uh, then uh, we're going to give that a quick toss. Uh, what I like to say is about 15 seconds, but really use your nose uh, and smell. You start smelling garlic and ginger. Uh, that's you know you're in the right place. 
On sale at Target for $8.99. I am for 100% gonna buy that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for dragging that down. Alright, so there's our ground turkey going into the wok. Uh, and then what I'm doing right now is I'm basically just running the spatula through it uh, and making sure that we break up those large clumps, especially if you're using uh, ground mints that has been defrosted. Uh, that stuff is going to start up on you uh, and that's never a good thing because you're generally going to start like biting into large chunks of ground meat, which is not. Nobody likes that. All right. Yeah. So this will take, uh, I like to give our ground mince, by the way, the ground mince is the only thing that's cooking in our stir fry today. Uh, so I like to give it a little bit of a head start, usually about a minute, maybe a minute and a half. Uh, and that's going to give us uh, some uh, a nice good cook on our ground mince. It does not have to be cooked all the way through. That is not a requirement because we are also going to long braise this uh, for another like three, four minutes. Uh, mostly what we're doing is just letting it pick up a little bit of color. That's looking good. So next up, here's our tofu going in. This should be our stinky tofu. Here we are using regular old tofu. Uh, then next is our sauce base. Uh, and then I like to give that a little bit of water uh, to just sort of loosen up. That's maybe a quarter cup of water. Uh, once the tofu is in the wok, you'll notice we're not going to do any real aggressive tossing anymore. Uh, and that's just to make sure that we don't break up the tofu uh, because the tofu is very, very delicate here. Yeah, it would be cool to use it in the, in the next stream. I 100% will do that. <laughs> This bowl is hot. Uh, finally, last, adding a little bit of our chili oil. This actually doesn't need all of the chili oil that we made here. Uh, those tangents, by the way, they are absolutely optional. You don't have to drop that stuff in. I just think that they're pretty, so I like to include them. All right, so we're gonna let that go. That will take maybe another, I don't know, maybe two, three minutes, and that's gonna give us a nice deep red color once that starts coming together. Alright, so last up, here's our cornstarch slurry going in. Now, super important, and I actually recently discovered this. Uh, when you add cornstarch slurry, or cornstarch, especially when it's in a cornstarch slurry, uh, that stuff, it has to go on top of the food. So we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is go around the sides like we normally do with oil, um, which is essentially trying to coat the wok in oil. We want the cornstarch slurry, it's got to go right on top. Uh, if you hit the sides of the wok, it's going to start cooking the cornstarch, uh, and that's basically going to uh, create this nice, this interesting and like kind of gross uh, gelatinous texture from the cornstarch, which is not what we're after. All 
Alright. I'm adding a little bit more of that chili oil in here. Do I eat the food after every stream? Of course. Uh, that would be lame if I didn't eat it. Uh, yeah, no, we cook it. I, I eat it every day. That's basically what we're doing. We're making dinner. Alright, there it is. Yeah, that's nice. <clears throat> there you are. Alright, finally what's up, I'm pulling this off here. Uh, and then the last thing that we want to do, and this is something that I have started saying at the end of every walk, so, uh, but actually true for pretty much anything that you're using uh, carbon steel for. You want to give that wok a uh, good rinse down while it's still hot, while the wok is hot. Uh, you got this nice non-stick surface going on, uh, which makes it a whole lot easier to clean. We had let that sit in the wok and then came back, say, like after you finish eating, like 45 minutes later. Uh, that stuff is going to be a lot harder to get off the wok, uh, and you're probably going to have to start like scrubbing and stuff, which is not fun, but also it's probably going to start scrubbing off patina uh, and just generally doing stuff to your wok that you probably don't want to do. There it is, and that one nice and clean and ready to cook again. What can you substitute for cornstarch? Yeah, so you can you can use really any kind of starch. Cornstarch is really just, uh, that's just the one that I use, mostly because it's really, really cheap, uh, and I can find it really easily in Chinatown. Um, but you could, use, you could use any kind of starch that you want. You might even, I'm pretty sure you could probably do it with flour. Uh, you could just straight up use two tablespoons of flour and it would achieve the same thing. Uh, very commonly though, you'll also see the use of things like potato starch or tapioca starch uh, in Chinese cooking. So if you go to like a Chinese market, uh, you will generally see uh, on the shelves right next to each other will be like rice flour, corn starch, tapioca starch, and potato starch will be the big four. Uh, and the, depending on like who's cooking and what they want to use when they're cooking, uh, you could use any of those things inter interchangeably. Uh, but also, I'm pretty sure uh, if you can't find those things or if you don't uh, have time to go get them, uh, you could probably substitute them out with just plain old flour. Low carb thickener, yeah, I guess that's essentially what uh, cornstarch is. Cornstarch is low carb. I don't know. Uh, the tangent peppers, by the way, are completely inedible. Uh, you can start picking them out now if you want. They're not doing anything. They're really just there for presentation. Uh, but I like to leave them because I think they're pretty. So I forgot the most important ingredient. All right, I totally forgot the last and most important, uh, it's literally in the name, uh, ingredient. This is our Szechuan peppercorn, which I'm passing through a little bit of a sieve. Uh, if you don't want to do that though, that's also a presentation thing. Uh, the flowers, I find that the petals of Szechuan peppercorn, they can kind of like get stuck in your teeth, uh, which is a little bit annoying. Uh, so what I like to do is I like to pass it through a sieve like this uh, and just sort of like uh, remove and sort of like uh, filter out some of those flowers, which are a little bit annoying to bite into. Uh, but if you don't want to, I oftentimes will just leave it in. 
Uh, especially if I'm feeling lazy, it's gonna be just fine. The walk cleaning hack is gonna change your life, yeah. Uh, for sure, you're gonna wanna clean that thing while it's hot. Uh, it's a little bit annoying uh, because generally, by the time that you start cleaning the walk, uh, you're probably gonna be pretty hungry. <laughs> Uh, and there's also like lots of food to eat that's sitting right in front of you and you just want to eat and eat it. Um, but definitely take, take the extra like 20 seconds is basically all it takes. Maybe 20, 30 seconds if it's really dirty. Uh, and it will save you 10 minutes after dinner. <laughs> so uh, do yourself a favor, clean that thing while it's hot. Cool. Yeah. Low carb thickener. I wonder if is low carb thickener like a, a xanthan gum. Okay, yeah, yeah. I thought xanthan gum is sweet. Well, maybe not. Maybe that's just because it's used on, on gum. Uh, yeah, but really any kind of starch that you have, uh, any starch will work uh, as long as it is like uh, powdery and as long as it dissolves in water. Uh, you, you, just fine. Uh, I kind of think of it like it's, it's pretty similar to what you would use. Um, actually, I think of two different things. So in Italian cooking, we do something very similar uh, with pasta water, which is essentially the water that you cook the pasta in. Uh, and in that water, it contains a whole bunch of starch that's coming off the noodles. Uh, and that's essentially used in things like carbonaras and bolognese and ragus, stuff like that, uh, to thicken up those sauces because you're basically just adding a liquefied form of starch to that sauce base. Uh, I also think about like in French cooking, we do something very similar with a roux, uh, which is basically a flour. I think a roux requires milk, like flour and milk, uh, and that's basically doing the same thing. We're kind of like creating thickness and things like uh, cheese sauces, stuff like that, uh, all, all serving the, basically the same purpose. We're essentially just adding starch uh, to a liquid form of sauce or, or, uh, or stir fry or whatever it is that you're working with, uh, and kind of like thickens up that sauce base. So very, very similar. Uh, so you think, think of it, that mindset is like all of the things that you could use. Uh, but if you're in a Chinese grocery store, those are the, the big ones that you'll see all next to each other. And that's the reason why they're always next to each other is because they're all used for the same purpose. Uh, I usually see, when I'm at the store, I'll see potato, potato starch, tapioca starch, uh, corn starch, and then I actually see a lot is like glutinous rice flour, uh, which has a different purpose. You actually use that in a lot of desserts. Uh, but also, I'm pretty sure you could use it for the same purpose. It would do the same thing. Yeah, cornstarch, uh, my, my uh, preference has always been cornstarch. Uh, I find that it, it just like, it works best. I find that it's a little bit more concentrated than like tapioca starch or potato starch. Um, but also mostly because it's, it's the one that I can find like the easiest. I could literally find it at the corn, corner store and you'll find cornstarch. Uh, cornstarch is like readily available in American grocery stores too. So that's, uh, you're probably not gonna find like tapioca or potato starch in most American grocery stores. That's gonna be a little bit trickier to find. Uh, and also there's like no real reason why you have to go out of your way to get Things. You could, uh, they don't taste like anything, so th there's no reason why you got to use those things. So. Flour and butter, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Cool. You know you're having dip for dinner tomorrow? Yeah, Sister Silent, let me know how that goes. Uh, I always love to see how other how it goes for other people. Uh, we've been using the, the subreddit for Wu Can Cook, r slash Wu Can Cook. Uh, to like kind of people have been posting pictures. I saw somebody took a shot at the string bean chicken today, uh, which is super fun. I love seeing when uh, other people, like how other people do when they attempt the recipes. Lots of people always forget to take photos of the dish after they finish cooking it because they're they're busy eating it. Uh, but if you try try one of the recipes, uh, remember to take a picture and send it to me. I love love seeing the pictures. Cool. All right, thanks everyone for tuning in. My name is Wesley, this is Wu Can Cook. If this is your first time tuning in, uh, we're here every, streaming every Tuesday and Thursday at 6.30 PST. We may lose that Thursday pretty soon because we're gonna have to start prepping on that day. Uh, but for now, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6.30 PST. Uh, with the new recipes, those are out every day, or every Friday over on the YouTube channel. So uh, if you're watching on Reddit and you haven't checked out the YouTube channel yet, that's the channel at the bottom of the screen. Uh, all of the recipes, they're coming out every Friday. So new recipes, the full length recipes are out every Friday. Uh, the music is out. So the Wu Cooks Beats tunes are out on the short, uh, the YouTube shorts every Wednesday. Uh, and then the short recipes are out every Monday when I remember to do them. So short recipes on Monday, uh, music on Wednesdays, and then full length recipes on Fridays. So uh, if you're tuning in and check out the YouTube channel, all that content pops over up over there. So lots of fun stuff coming up soon. 
uh, what else? Uh, this Thursday coming up, we're going to be doing some pad si. Actually, we're going to do uh, pad si, which is the first time that we've cooked on a Thursday in a while. So uh, we're, gonna, we're finally doing a recipe that is not a new recipe, which means uh, that we're finally cooking something that I have cooked many times before. And I'm going to be a little bit more comfortable and I won't make as many mistakes. <laughs> um, so lots of stuff like that popping up over on YouTube. Uh, we're working our way up to 6,000 subscribers by the end of the month. So if you want to help us hit our subscriber goal, uh, please hop over and give it a subscribe. Lots of fun content coming up. Cool. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions. I'll be here uh, doing dishes and eating dinner. So cool. Thanks, everyone. See you soon.
Thank you. 